Well, hello everyone, this is Al Fadi. Welcome back to a continuation of this exceptional video series that we're doing here, myself and Dr. J, which we have entitled MBS, The Great Islamic Reformer. And we've talked, of, uh, of course, we build our talk around that amazing interview that he did with Al Arabiya uh, TV. And that was done on April 27th of 2021. So far, we talked about MBS's vision for Saudi, known as the 2030 vision. Then we talked about the elephant in the room, and that's the extremism or Salafism or Wahhabism, whatever we want to call it. Today, we're going to address throwing this elephant out. And of course, with me here to unpack this, our dear brother, Dr. J. Dr. J, welcome back. Oh, it's good to be back. So Thank we you. talked about the elephant in the room. What are we going to do with that elephant? Yeah, well, the elephant in the room, of course, and let's define it, the elephant in the room that, that Mudaifa brought up is, what are you going to do with the Salafis? What are you going to do with the Wahhabis? What are you going to do with the traditions? What are you going to do with the Sira, the biography of the Prophet? What are you going to do with the Hadith, the sayings of the Prophet? What are you going to do with the Tafsir and the Tahri, the histories, and I mean, the commentaries and the histories of, of all mankind? That, these are the four genres and what we know as the standard Islamic narrative, SIN, mm -hmm. or the Islamic traditions. You can't, you've got to deal with them. And he dealt with them. He said it very clearly. He said, we're going to eradicate the Hassan and the Taif, the, the, the weak ones. We're going to keep to the Sahih, which would be the resolute ones, ones that are strong, but only those which correspond with the Quran. So the Quran will be the testimony. The Quran will be the witness. The Quran will be the standard. This is the constitution of Saudi Arabia. This will be the constitution. This will direct what we keep, what we throw out, which he didn't know at the time. I don't think he still knows, but many of the Muslim scholars around the world are saying, if he's going to keep to that, that's 90% of the traditions how, or will you have to throw out. 90% of the hadith you're going to have to throw out and just keep 10%. And those 10% are all directed or dictated by this book, the Quran. So here's that, to me, I, that, I thought that was genius. I thought the guy really does know what he's talking about. This guy has a, has a vision. But then I went up to my different my, uh, to my different videos. I put up three videos and I looked at the comments. I love to look at the comments and I and I suggest all of those of you who are watching do put the comments there. Do talk about them. I, I want to hear your reaction to what we're saying. Uh, we have now a Saudi Arabian here. Uh, he used to be a Muslim. Uh, this is your background, so you, you're talking mm -hmm. from a Saudi Arabian standpoint. And what I'm hearing in the comments is, this guy's not going to make it. He's going to probably be assassinated. They're saying things like, this guy, how can he stay, uh, how can he be the ruler with this kind of program? Nobody in their right mind would dare to say something like this. And that's the knee-jerk reaction that I would expect. It is, uh, but may I add to this also? It seemed like it's coming from maybe people who are not familiar with the demographic, uh, you know, uh, of Saudi and also the present population uh, of Saudi. You're dealing with a majority of Saudi Arabians who are young in age, who are eager to see changes like this, who, quite frankly, I think they are going to be on cloud nine when they see these kind of changes. So the outsiders probably are thinking this way, but from within Saudi, he has the majority of people in his sight. Uh, absolutely. Let me give you an example. When I was in London, I would get up at Speaker's Corner and I would go down there every Sunday. The ones that were at the base of my ladder were all the Salafis. These were the most mm -hmm. extreme of the extreme. And the, uh, Speaker's Corner is a magnet for them, so I would expect them. I love to work with them. They were the ones I engaged with the most, and I did so for 25 years. And I remember whenever I left Speaker's Corner and went outside to the rest of London, I came across, well, there's a million Muslims. You can't help but come across Muslims, and I would talk to them. And the Muslims I met out side of Speaker's Corner were diametrically different than the ones at Speaker's Corner. Mm -hmm. And the ones at Speaker's Corner really represented a very small minority of all the other ones that I saw outside. And the ones outside, they were getting fed up with what they were hearing on the news. They were getting fed up with what they were seeing almost every week, that one headline after another, another Muslim has blown up this place or shut down this place or run a truck into these people or uh, uh, you name it, there was violence after violence. And they were getting upset because because justifiably so, they're saying, this does not represent me. I do not like what I've seen in the news. And I do not like the, the, all the news articles and all the newspapers saying that this is Islam. Because this is not my Islam. This is not me. They were basically saying, not in my name. Do not represent me when you're saying that these guys and these gals are doing these stupid things all over the world. Right. And what I'm hearing outside of Speaker's Corner, I realize was the bigger part of Islam. These were the majority. And the majority of Muslims that I know 
are belong to this group out here, the group that want to be peaceful, the group that have left many of their countries to come to the West so that they can leave that side of Islam. They want the real Islam. They want actually what we see right here. Take a look at here. This is what they want. That's right. I mean, uh uh, I know or some of my own uh, family uh, members are already, you know, excited about what's happening in Saudi. And by the way, I mean, I, I, I want to go back and say this, and, and this is me speaking because I know my culture, I know my government, I know MBS is, um, you know, the direction that he's trying to take and the power that he has. You have a minority group who definitely can be a thorn on any side. I mean, look at just ISIS and what ISIS did, and it was just a minority group. And they can certainly attract young radicals, without a doubt. But the beauty about MBS and also the power that he has, he can put his thumb on those. What I worry about are the radicals outside, not inside. With that in mind, let me ask you this. You mentioned radicals, minorities at the speaker's corner. This group is absolutely scary and intimidating, without a doubt. Why is that, Jay? Well, I would suggest they are absolutely scary and intimidating, mainly because we let them be so. They are you the see, ones, nobody's thumping them. We are yeah. basically, any yeah. time they do an atrocity, it's right across all of our headlines. Right. It right. comes into our living room. Right. And of course, it shocks all of us, and we're scared to death of them because we think, oh, we're next. We're going to be the ones that are going to be attacked by them. But look, take a look and ask, how much ha damage have they really done? around the world. Mm -hmm. Oh, they take out maybe 200 here, 2,000 at 9-11. Uh, That's the biggest so far that I've seen in any one, uh, any one endeavor. They really don't really affect much of us. They thought, people thought that they would bring down our economy. They didn't bring down the American economy after 9-11. What have they really done? What damage? But see, we proclaim them, we broadcast them so loudly that everybody thinks this is Islam. And I'm finding when I go around from church to church to church to church, the first question that's asked me in my question answer period is, Jay, why haven't they killed you yet? I said, why are you even asking that question? 99% of Muslims do not want to touch me. 99% of Muslims are just like you and me. Right. The 1% that you're talking about are the ones that are in our news all the time. We are our own biggest problem because we create this fear. We create this image of Islam that is pernicious now and which uh, uh, gets, gets into everybody's mind. That therefore, Islam, Islam or Muslims are a religion of violence. Muslims are not violent folks. That's not true. I mean, I mean, uh, let, let's be fair. I mean, we understand that we need to distinguish between the teaching and what Muslims uh, the masses know about this teaching. Only a handful know about it. That's why they are the radicalized ones. That's the, why they're the zealot ones. And now, uh, you know, uh, uh, the prince, uh, uh, you know, uh, MBS is basically cutting into that as well. He's saying, even your sources, I'm going to filter it out. Uh, uh, to me, I mean, he's done a genius job because yeah. what he has done is he's saying, I am going to now introduce a new Islam. An Islam that is based on technology, an Islam that's based on learning, a base, an Islam that's based on research, an Islam that has towering buildings, that has some of the most advanced cities in the world, that has a neon project, this line here that goes 110 miles. Nobody has done this before. I'm going to show you a new Islam. This is the Islam that we want the world to see. This is the Islam that we would like people to suddenly identify with. And as a Muslim, I want to, I would identify with this. As a Muslim, I would want this. Yeah. Even as a Christian, I would want this. As a Christian, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, this is what everybody in the world wants. Stop and think. Not just Muslims. Isn't this what the world wants? Isn't this what the world is get, has been waiting for? Haven't we been waiting for someone to say this, to start building buildings like this, to start letting women start to drive and now saying that they don't have to cover up, to get rid of this view of Islam as being provincial and 7th century and being barbaric and isolated? Or don't we really want a religious Islam that, that we could go to, that we could bring home to tea? I, I, I would say, this is the kind of Islam I like to introduce to my mother. This is the Islam that I would suggest 90 to 99% of the Muslim world really is. But they don't know, they never had anybody represent them like this because all that we see in our newspaper are the Salafis and the extremists yeah. and, the, and the, the bombings and the violence and everything else. And so we pretty much are have foisted this on them and the Muslims are getting fed up with this. And I hear Muslims say this all the time. This is not, does not represent me. But MBS, what he's bringing forward, 
that's something that does represent them. That they can be proud exactly. of. That's an identity they can grab and hold on to. And I would suggest maybe the rest of the world would also agree with that. I would suggest every country will want to support this model, will want to support this project, will want to support this vision, Vision 2030. It's not just a vision for Saudi Arabia. This is a vision for the whole world. This is a vision yeah. for you and me. This is a vision for all the 1.8 billion Muslims who, are, who don't have anybody representing them, have never had a voice before, and now they want this voice. Yeah. Well, back to you as a Saudi Arabian. Well, How I, do you feel? I mean, it feels great. And I tell you what, Jay, I mean, isn't this what you and I have been doing for the last uh, two years at least. You started with that. We've been doing it together as well from time to time. Talking about, I mean, MBS has has a, a lot of room to do what he's trying to do simply because we're discovering things that cut into the origin of Islam, the sources of Islam, the fact that some of it was added later. So he does have a lot of power to reevaluate all of this and indeed, reform it. Okay, you're kind of jumping to the next episode, but before you do that, yeah. before we get into that, I want to just back up a little bit. What we're saying is maybe this is the next reformation. Maybe this man, MBS, is the next reformer. And to understand that, we need to look at our own tradition. Remember, we had a reformation uh, in the Christianity. We had the reformer. His name was Martin Luther. And Martin Luther, he nailed those 95 theses up on the door. Right. And he basically, basically, he said the same thing MBS is saying. Did you notice what MBS said? Go back to the Quran. What right. do you think Martin Luther said? Sola, Sola scriptura. scriptura. Come back to the Bible. Nothing but what's in the Bible. This is what Martin Luther held up and said, right. only that which is in this book must we hold to. This becomes our litmus, this becomes our but, standard. And did MBS not say the exact same thing on April 27th? This will, let me put it right side up so I get it yeah. the right way. Didn't MBS say this will be our standard, this will be our litmus, this is what everything must be dictated by? Just like Martin Luther, do you see the parallels there? It is, and my hope and prayer is that also uh, the Crown Prince will take it a step further because all we need now to do is even reform the interpretation of some of those problematic passages. Okay, we're going to get into that. You're jumping ahead again. I, I can see where you're well, going. I, I but let's just stop to right be here. Thinking along these Stop lines. and think. Yeah. Are we not looking at a new reformation in Islam? Is Absolutely. this not the reformation Absolutely. that we had in the 1500s? That was we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about 600 years, almost 600 years ago. We've had our reformation by one man. But see, Martin Luther was not a very powerful man, was he? No, he was not. I mean, just a priest. It's just his movement uh, picked off. He was a priest, yeah. but he had a book that really was more powerful than anything he said or did. And when people, and what he did, he's made sure that this book could be read by everybody. And so he had it basically, he had it translated into the languages of the people so they could read it for themselves. And that started the Reformation, which has had an impact on you and me. We're part of that Reformation. They call us protesters. We were protesting the traditions of the church. Yes, we are Protestants, protesters. But see, let's look at the guy behind this one, MBS. He is the new reformer, but does he not have an awful lot more power than Martin Luther had in his day? Huge amount more power because of look what he's already done. See, Martin Luther had nothing to show for it. Martin Luther had nothing that he was bringing people to. He had no vision of a new world order uh, like MBS have. MBS, he has all this working for him. MBS is already six years into this project, only nine more years to go. I think it's going to go beyond 2030. Mm -hmm. It'll probably be 2040, 2050, but they're calling it 2030 because some of the technology hasn't even been invented, like the, the rail line that they're talking about or the flying cars. Those have yet to be invented. They will be. They will be. But can you see? But the this? infrastructure and everything most likely will be in place or at least everyone can see something tangible by 2030. So if he is the reformer for Islam, he's coming into it with a lot more clout, a lot more power, and a lot more accomplishments. He's already saying, I'm not just making, I'm giving you an idea, I'm actually showing you what we're doing. That's right. And by the way, this is powerful. You know why? Because Saudi Arabia, as I always say, is the, not only the place where Islam is perceived to have originated from, but it's the model for what Islam would look like. And to have these kind of ambitious statements coming out from the top authority, it will send a lot of shock waves both ways for those who are excited about it and then for the minority who will be discouraged by it. No, to be fair, 
MBS also sees the future, and he sees the future is no longer oil. Everything's going green. Mm -hmm. uh, we've just seen uh, how Europe is now pretty much saying by 2030, they want, uh, 2040, they want everything in Europe to be electric. Uh, here in the United States, maybe a little later. But if that is the case, no more oil is needed. If there's no more oil needed, then what is Saudi Arabia going to do for its finances? They're realizing that they've got to diversify into mm -hmm. other areas, and they're moving all these petrodollars in to this diversification. So it stands for, it's, it's common sense that he's doing what he's doing. We understand that part of it. What I like about it is that he's already saying, yes, but we're diversifying not just because of the fact that we no longer have oil to sell, but we're diversifying because we want to be the center of the world. Now, if that is the case, there is a glaring problem. There is one problem that's gonna stand in the way. We're gonna get to that, and that will be the next episode. Do you want to give people a teaser? No, I don't want to give them a teaser. I want them to come. Okay, well, but everyone, has... I tried. <laughs> All right, I'll say this. It has to do with one book. All right. Well, of course, I mean, it won't be Jay if there is no book and man to be talking about. Book but, the man uh, in the place. But uh, all that to say, uh, really, um, this is, uh, you have no idea how excited I am about all of this. Uh, it's, uh, I, I would really, uh, uh, you know, step out in faith and say this is an answer to prayer. There are many people that prayed for Saudi, many people prayed for my people, many people prayed for uh, this kind of change to take place, and it's amazing. It is absolutely amazing changes. I know of other things that MBS is also considering, but I don't want to bring it up here because I do not want to jump ahead of the curb anyway. All that to say is I love this man, and I pray for him, for his safety, and I pray that the Lord will continue to bless him and give him wisdom to take this uh, you know, uh, country and uh, the direction into the future, uh, making it possible for all of us really to once and for all, hopefully, have a open-minded dialogue with our Muslim people without having to yell at each other, scream at each other, and receive threats from each other, and so on and so forth. With that in mind, we're going to talk about the book next time. Thank you, as always. Everyone, thank you so much for being here with us. See you next time. This is Al-Fadi. Over and out. God bless. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sierra International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.